of the 9 o'clock hour, House Majority Leader Eric Householder joins us via telephone. Eric, good morning to you. Good morning, gentlemen. How you guys doing? We're doing great. Thanks for asking, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, sorry about last month. I had to have someone cover for me. So it's been a while. So how are you guys? <laughs> I'm so. doing good. I, I report no HVAC <laughs> problems whatsoever since our last conversation. <laughs> that's that's great. That's that's good. That's good to hear. So you must have had a perfect install. So, but uh, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> and who was that install done by, Rob? Eric, householder and company. There we what, go. What was your buddy's name that was with you? I forgot. Uh, Mike. Mike. Yeah, and not yeah. Hornby either. He's got Hornby endangered no, servitude. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Yeah, if you want that bill passed, you'll lift that up and move it. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, has anyone went over the revenue numbers with you guys? That's why we. That's why we have you as the expert on call, Eric. The numbers missed. Now I heard a later explanation by I guess Vernon and Chris that it was a technical issue and not necessarily a revenue issue. Well, it's timing of certain personal income tax uh, uh, credits that the governor announced, but. Uh, no, we're still firing on all cylinders. Things are still looking fairly decent. And let me go over some of those numbers with you. Uh, so for the month of February, uh, the personal income tax, it was estimated, uh, revenue estimated that we would bring in $91.5 million. We only brought in $28.9 million. The uh, consumer sales tax, revenue estimated that we would bring in $144 million. We brought in $142 million. So we're off, with, off about $2.4 million. A severance tax. Uh, severance tax. We estimated 24 million, but we brought in 31 million, so a little stronger. And then our corporate net income tax revenue had estimated for the month 1.5 million. We brought in 6.4, so we exceeded estimates by approximately 4.9. So overall, revenue estimated that we would bring in about 313 million for the month, and we brought in 283 million. So we're a negative $30 million, but we're still exceeding our estimates. General revenue is still exceeding our estimates of about $428 million. So we're still $428 million to the good after eight months in. So The question on, on this, uh, Eric, as you mm -hmm. mentioned, it, it seemed to be a matter of timing, but are you concerned about any trends? In other words, will, will this uh, surplus get whittled away as the months go by, or will it get added too? No, I think it's going to get added to. Keep in mind, I had said if we could maintain roughly about a $60 million surplus each month, January you brought in 120 month. I had mentioned before, back in December, if, if you maintain a $60 million, you would be on target of seeing at least a $700 million surplus. And I think you can get relatively close. You still have another $240 million that you could add to this, and uh, we would be right there around my prediction. So... I, th I think we're still fine. Are you concerned with this drop and the federal government's attempt to get back almost a half a billion dollars for the state's revenues? Uh, no, I am not. And uh, keep in mind, you know, um, a lot of this happened with the previous super state superintendent, um, Roach, Superintendent Roach. So just and I don't know what you're familiar with and, and, and for your listeners as well. Uh, with that COVID money, there were separate funds for COVID money to help for schools with the Department of Education, the fund for masks and virtual schools and everything else under the sun. And basically, the state did not maintain their funding efforts to match that those federal dollars. Now, none of us was aware of it. Obviously, the uh, state superintendent didn't make any mention of it to the legislature or to the governor's office. And so we're in a situation where we have this clawback. Um, but keep in mind, um, the, the, uh, there has been negotiations with the feds, and we're not the only state in the nation with this. Keep, you might have heard that the feds changed the rules. I know the speaker alerted us that the feds had changed the rules nine times in 11 weeks. And I don't know if you've heard that mentioned on this radio station or not. Yes. There's a lot of truth to that. And uh, so we're not holding any – we're not going to hold any county – uh, responsible for this because how could you um but uh with our availability of doing some education spending uh if we can show and we have shown that we are maintaining a level of spending that the feds would say okay that's negotiated we're done so i don't think we'll ever have to send one dollar back to the feds who's in charge of this by the way what do you mean who's in charge 
whether or not we have to send money back to the feds. Is this a Larry well, Pack, uh, Pack thing, or is it the governor, or what? No, I mean, there's been uh, negotiation going between the revenue and with the, with the feds. And, no, that's, uh, that's what I mean. Who's, who's doing the negotiating <laughs> yeah. is my question. Well, Department of Revenue and the governor's chief of staff. And you, so we're able to show that, hey, look, last year we passed a, a state pay raise bill. This also, you know, we've had a teacher pay raise. We're contemplating passing on another one. There's been X amount of dollars spent in education-related expenses. So all that will count towards the $465 million clawback. And that's what I'm saying. It, you're, you'll never have to pay you know, a dollar back. Um, but you'll have to have at least $465 million in educational spending, which we have. I mean, mm -hmm. we had the K through three uh, spending for AIDS. I mean, that's a $370 million on full implementation. We've passed five pay raises. So I think the legislature has done everything to show a good effort that we are you know, interested and we are, uh, you know, we are making a, a good effort to make sure that we are spending taxpayer dollars wisely for education. Well, if these funds have been spent toward education already, Eric, why doesn't the federal government mm -hmm. recognize that before they send this bill? Well, I mean, that's a good question. But keep in mind, like I mentioned earlier, I mean, these counties did what they were told to do by the State Department of Education. And then a rule changed after they had already spent the money. So the new rules came out. So then they started spending money according to that rule that came out. And the next thing you know, the rules changed again. So, you know, uh, I, think, I think the breakdown was from the previous state superintendent, Superintendent Roach. And that's why we're in this situation today. But uh, I think moving forward, I think the deal has been um, – communicated between all parties as long as we're showing a good faith effort to invest in education there's not going to be any clawback that's what I'm, that's what we're being told in this negotiation will yeah. that mean you have to spend the money in a certain way towards education in other words if they had changed the rules nine times in 11 weeks and you weren't able to keep up will they say well here are the rules for how you now have to put that money into education no, and I think uh, what our chief of staff for the governor and, and course revenue, they're saying, hey, these are what we've passed so far to date. This should be used to offset any of the clawback. And I think from what I'm hearing, the feds have agreed. So, no, they're not micromanaging it in that degree, if, if that's your question. Yes, yeah, that was the idea. Yeah. Is if, if you didn't use it properly, then are they demanding that you use it in a specific way now? Well, that but one. But but Matt, one would also argue they were using the money properly, but then right. they came out with a different rule change. So, you know, that's the caveat with federal money. Anytime federal money, when the strings that are attached to it, that's the problems that uh, states can get into. And here you are, a prime example. So, and it's uh, it's a majority of the states, from what I understand, have this issue. Did they, I mean, did they pick and choose how, I mean, I would assume if they changed the rules 10 times that every state probably has issues with this education money. Every state from what we're hearing has the same, they're in the same situation that West Virginia is in. And uh, I think the same concessions are going to apply, you know, nationally with these states as well, that obviously if they're showing some good faith effort to be spending this money, it all came down to, with the federal money that was uh, given, there was state matches that that weren't done. So obviously the state was not matching the federal dollars, and that's really the crux of where the issue is. You had mentioned earlier the the surplus heading somewhere toward you believe somewhere towards seven hundred million for yes, this fiscal. Yes. That's lower than last fiscal. Is this a trend, or what is what's um, what's going on with that? I mean, seven hundred million dollars—that's uh, pretty substantial. Oh, even it's with huge! A, uh, yes. Yeah, even, even with a twenty-two percent personal income tax cut, and uh, that's why I'm hoping that the trigger will happen again. And um, but no, when you're when you're still exceeding, keep in mind when you're still exceeding general revenue by four hundred twenty-eight million, and on target to see seven hundred million, it's going to be important that we control the rate of spending. I've advocated it time and time again to continue the flatline budget. I've been a big, huge proponent of smaller government, lemon government. And if you're going to continue to go that course, you should be able to reward our citizens with 
the uh, in- income tax relief that they've been asking for for years. So I- I'm not concerned. You know, um, I think if you continue with the flatline budget and as you see more economic growth come into the to the state, you're going to see the same surpluses of uh, $200 million to $700 million in that range. And I think uh, that's what you're going to continue to see. That's, that's my, my uh, prediction. And as a citizen of West Virginia, we appreciate the tax decrease. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And Anytime we, we can put more mon- money back in your pocket, that's a good thing. Well, and we like flatline budgets yeah. because we uh, we like the fact that our state spends its money better, spends our money, our tax money, better than probably any other state in the country, and we appreciate that. There you go. Will it take a couple of years to see the the income tax coming back into the hands of West Virginia citizens, possibly increasing then in other areas like sales tax because now, hey, I've got more money in my pocket. I'm going to be able to go spend that money. I think so. I mean, you're seeing some of it. I mean, obviously, for the month of February, sales tax was off by about $2 million, but um uh, I think you're going to see more and more economic growth. That's the whole thing about theory. Economic theory is if you want more of something, you should you should tax uh, less of it. So we're putting economic theory to the test, and we're about to find out here in the next couple of years if that's true. Delegate Eric House, to our guest, he is the House Majority Leader. Go ahead, Matt. You're about to follow up. I was just going to ask about the the budget as a whole, and with the the federal government, you know, stipulating this 465 million, and and it has to be used in a certain way uh, with the budget negotiations and trying to get that wrapped up. How is that impacting your your negotiations? It it, it hasn't. Uh... Uh, keep in mind today on the budget bill is on third reading today. So for your listeners, if you want to tune in at 11 o'clock, go to WV Legislature. You'll see the link for the the uh, video for the House, where you can listen to the audio link. And uh, we will have the uh, budget presentation on the floor. It's on third reading, up for passage. And just for a procedural of, of what's going to happen today, the Senate has taken the lead this year on the budget. So the Senate budget is over here right now. Uh, their budget is their general revenue budget is about 4.9 billion. The House budget is like 5 billion, 1 million. So we're relatively close. So what will happen today? The House will amend our budget into the Senate's budget and then pass it. And then, of course, today, as any amendments, members obviously are allowed to uh, offer amendments to the budget. They'll be either voted up or down. And then we'll send that budget back to the Senate. And then there's a compromise that is reached between the two disagreeing budgets. And from that compromise, we'll have it probably on Friday. And that'll be the budget that uh, goes into effect for the, for the next fiscal year. And that's how it works. Eric, you are a candidate for auditor. Yes. Last week, Senator Mike Stewart put out a press release questioning J.B. McCuskey, the state, current state auditor, in regards to this federal government request for about a half a billion dollars to be returned, asking mm-hmm. where was J.B. McCuskey when this money was being spent? He's the auditor. Uh, right. and I, I realize that there are other issues in regards to him calling out J.B. I, I understand right. the, the political implications of that right. and such. But on its face... Uh, was the auditor in charge of uh, taking a look at the expenditures for this money, or was that not his responsibility? It was not his responsibility because the auditor does not have statutory authority to intervene uh, with the Department of Education. Now, I can tell you, because I asked the question of the state auditor, did you ask? And the answer was yes, they asked, and uh, they were told um, you know, they're going to handle it. Now, what the auditor's office did do, because there were separate funds of COVID money that was being applied to municipalities and to counties, um, the auditor did ask counties and municipalities if, if they could intervene and help these counties and municipalities from misspending the money. And the auditor was able to intervene. And guess what? There wasn't one misuse of uh, monies that we're aware of. So... And that was a different pot of funds. But uh, to answer the first part of your question, it's just more politics. Uh, but, no, the auditor doesn't have statutory authority to intervene. Good so. answer. Uh, yeah. I want to ask you also about the uh, unemployment bill that's working its way through right now, SB 841. 
Uh, yes. And I know the House is going to have to deal with this as well. And I understand also in talking with Mike Height, Delegate Height said that uh, some votes may be influenced by a couple of the closures in the state with some places that employ a large number of people. Yeah, I'm very disappointed. I know they spent last night about three and a half, four hours last night debating it in finance. It is uh, a watered-down version of unemployment reform that we had talked about years ago. I mean, even when I was finance chair, this this same unemployment bill, I, I got it as far as second reading, and there were a lot of amendments to the bill, and we were able to stop all the amendments, and then it got parked on House calendar. Now, this is supposed to be a compromise between the, the two houses, but we're struggling on the House side to get it across the finish line. And I'm even concerned that we may not even have enough votes to get it across the finish line because it's basically watered down. It really doesn't do uh, the intention of what the Senate sent to us uh, for the last several years. So we'll have to wait and see. Uh, I had to leave caucus early. As you know, we have caucus every morning, and uh, that was one of the discussions that was coming up, so I didn't get a chance to see uh, how the caucus felt. But uh, I am a little concerned that we may not even have enough votes to get it across the finish line. So we'll see. We'll know here in the next day or so. Eric, is there a way to do it where it, um, where it separates by county? As far as the rules where, you know, if one county has a, an unemployment rate of X, you know, it doesn't it, it doesn't apply to them. But if another county has a low, low unemployment rate or is it statewide, the bill? No, it's statewide. And that's how unemployment is referred to. What my concerns are, keep in mind, is the unemployment trust fund. As the unemployment trust fund starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller, then who pays into this un, uh, this unemployment trust fund? Well, it's employers. And how do employers pay in it, into it? Well, every employer in the state of West Virginia, for every employee that you have, you have to pay on the first $10,000 of wages that each employee makes. So the employer is charged a tax, an employer tax, on the first $10,000 of wages, and that money is what's used to fund the unemployment trust fund. Now, Unfortunately, a couple of years ago, we used $300 million of federal funds to prop up our unemployment trust fund. That's the only reason why it's even in a fairly decent shape right now is because of the uh, federal money that was sent out uh, during the COVID, COVID years. Um, I am concerned, like many others, that as this trust fund starts to dwindle down, the only, way, you know, the only two options you have is an infusion of cash from somewhere or you have to charge your employers more money. Well, that's the tax increase on all small businesses, and we don't want that in all businesses in the state. So uh, that's why I was a little disappointed. We had, I thought, a perfect opportunity to try to reform this, and uh, but we've had to reach a compromise, and we'll see if it even gets across the finish line. Eric, final word is yours. I know you got to get back to your people. <laughs> well, hey, uh, the race for a state auditor is going very well. Uh, I've been south of Harrison County. I've hit every county except for Mercer and Monroe. And uh, be on the lookout for a house order for auditor in a town near you. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you phrase that. Eric, thank you so much. We'll see you, gentlemen. Thanks.